I would invite you to definitely get a sermon handout because there's an activity that I want you all to do on the back page. So you can get one for your row if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to move. Katrina, could, oh, Steve, could you help me? This water looks like it might have been left here this week. And I have one down there, and if you could just replace it for me, that would be super awesome. And I know that because on the top of the water was a nice thin coat of something. And if you know me, you know I'm not going to drink it, so which will be good. Hey, while you guys are doing that, let me just greet all of you uh, this morning, because I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. Whether this is your first time with us or your 100th time, we are grateful that you are here in this space with us. Whether you arrived this morning because you completed an internet search because you were looking for a church, or you're here because you're out of town and you wanted a place to worship on your way back home, or you're here because you already knew the way or your familiar faces that I just look up and see. Hi, Fanning, how are you guys? We are grateful for your presence in uh, our space this morning. Each of us come with a gift of God, and we are grateful to receive the gift of God that you are uh, to us this morning. We gather before the celebration and we pray for you, and this morning we prayed three things uh, for you. The first was that you would experience welcome, that you would experience acceptance, that you would experience peace in this space as space is made available for you to have an encounter with the loving presence of our living God. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus is talking with some of the experts in the law. He has silenced a Sadducee, a law keeper, who has questioned for Jesus. And after that interaction, another expert in the law rises and asks Jesus a question. And it's his response, which is, I think for us, the basis of how we should see each other and how we should live as kingdom people. Now, in a cultural climate, the one in which we currently live in, where we're often invited or asked to see our neighbors as the hated other, someone who should be treated with contempt and mistrust, Jesus reminds us of something in Luke chapter 10. He reminds us of our call to trust God and to love him first, which will allow us to love our neighbors and others as we attempt to love ourselves. So what I want to do is start in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bible or your cell phone or your Palm Pilot, does anyone have a Palm Pilot anymore? I don't know why that was the next one that came to my mind, but I just thought I would share it with you. Maybe you have an iPod or iPad, something that can get you online and you can get to your Bible. Uh, We're going to be in Luke chapter 10 this morning, and I'm going to start in verse 25. On one occasion, the expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, in response to this question, Jesus asked his own question of the expert. In verse 26, he says, what is written in the law? And then he asks the second question, not only what's written in the law, but how do you read what's written there? Now, here, Jesus is flipping the expert's question back on to him. What's written? Then he couples it. How do you read it? Now here, he's sort of playing with this whole idea of how the rabbis in Jesus' day would work. They had what we would refer to as commentaries around the law. So they would have the law, and then they would write notes about the law. So here's what this means, here's what that means, here's how you would apply this in this situation. They were sort of giving folks tools and resources for how to imply what they were reading in Scripture. So when Jesus asked the question, How do you read it? He's saying, I bet you know what's in the law, but how are you willing to put it into practice? The expert replies in verse 27 by saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, this interchange is now over. Because the expert in the law demonstrates his mastery over the law. Because what he does 
is he plucks two, what I would argue, uh, one probably more familiar, but the other one maybe more obscure. But he takes two passages out of the law of Moses, and then he puts them together. First, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is a part of the Shema. I'll come to that in a moment. Then he joins Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, with Leviticus 19, 18, right? I mean, this is completely arbitrary how it's put together if you think about what he's doing. He's taking something from one book, and he's taking something from another book. He's stringing them together and then presenting that to Jesus as his answer. When's the last time you've memorized something so well that you can pluck two passages, two sentences, maybe from your favorite poem? for any of you who like poetry, or maybe um, two verses from your favorite song where you can maybe make the melodies fit together, where you can sing one into the other, right? This is what he's doing. He's demonstrating he understands the law by pulling these two passages together. Deuteronomy 19, 18 reads, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, he could have just answered Jesus with the Deuteronomy passage and been done. It's the most straightforward and simple response. Don't seek revenge. Love your neighbor as yourself. But I think as we lean into the expert here in the law, I think he understands something. I think he understood the importance of the Shema, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. This is the prayer that any observant Jew would offer to God daily, starting with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it would continue. And so the expert knows something that I think we should pay attention to, which is this, that the love of neighbor flows from the overflow of love that's experienced in our loving God with our whole heart with our whole soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength. When we become settled and secure in God's love and provision for us, his mercy for us, it enables us to do something. It enables us to love ourselves as we love others. So Jesus, in response to this expert in the law, in verse 28, says, you have answered correctly, ding, 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 you win the prize, winner, winner, chicken dinner, do this, and you will live. That's it, that's, the, that's it. If you just love God with everything that you have, and allow the overflow of the love that you're exposing and and, and sending towards God, and then he's reciprocating towards you to fuel how you live, everything will be okay. So if that's the question that the expert asks, then he's been answered. How do we live, if that's the question? How do I follow God in an unstable world? How do I ensure that I will be included in God's kingdom when it manifests itself in my midst? Then Jesus has answered, you already know what's expected of you. Go ahead and start doing it. But I think the expert realizes that what's written in the law is a little bit too much. It's almost like what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 20. The problem isn't the law, it's our ability to keep the law. That's the problem. So the expert asked Jesus another question in verse 29. Now, Luke puts a parenthetical here, okay, which I'll try to explain as I move along. But Luke says, but the expert wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who, pray tell, is my neighbor? Now, there are a number of ways to read this, right? There's some ways that we read this that comes towards the expert in the law, and there's some ways that we read it that leans us back. So I'm going to lean in. When the expert asks, who is my neighbor, I don't think he's being flippant. I think he wants what's been already given to him, which is a listing of what would qualify someone as a neighbor. Because once I know what qualifies someone as a neighbor, then I know who 
my neighbor is, and I know who my neighbor isn't. I think he just wanted a basic understanding. Now, when Luke says that he wanted to justify himself, let's look at it through maybe a first century Palestinian Jewish perspective. Well, to be justified meant to be saved. And to be saved meant to inherit eternal life. It goes all the way back to the original question. Verse 25, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus is saying, love God and love neighbor. Now he's saying, great, I'm willing to do that. Just tell me who my neighbor is. Being justified further is this idea that we are granted status as one before God whom God accepts as we stand before him. It's this sort of basic idea that we have right standing before God. So I think when he was getting at this, he was really earnestly seeking an explanation and a question. He wasn't just trying to be obnoxious. Now, based on the fact that the expert quotes Leviticus, I bet that the expert was expecting Jesus to define neighbor as someone who was just like him, a fellow Jew, someone who followed and observed the law. You know, when we look at this passage, because I'm going to get us to probably one of the most popular passages in Scripture other than John 3.16, which I bet all of you can quote because you've seen it at every football game. And so, right, there's, there's those banners at every football game that says John 3.16 as if that's going to save everyone that's watching, but it's good. So this passage that we're coming to is the Good Samaritan passage. Thanks, Tina. And so with regard to that, we all sort of have a basic understanding of what Jesus is going to do in the Good Samaritan. But before you get there, let's look at what's happening right here. The expert in the law is interacting with Jesus because he wants a clear definition. And there wasn't a tradition within Israel for loving one's enemies as yourself. Certainly there was a way of loving your fellow tribesmen, those who were in your tribe, those who were a part of the covenant. Yes, you had an obligation to love them, but not your enemies. From any reading of the law, one would be forgiven from assuming that God only punished the enemies of Israel. So what's about to happen is going to really mess with the expert in the law. And so since he's asked this question, who is my neighbor, do you know what Jesus does? He tells him a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled and came where the man was, he saw him and he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put his, the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after this man, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, there's a lot in the passage. There's a lot that we don't really get in the passage. Why is he talking about a priest and a Levite and a Samaritan? And I'll just give you a really quick um, insight to those things, but it's not uh, germane primarily to what I'm trying to do in my text. So the priest, he would have been called into service in the temple. So touching someone who was openly bleeding on the side of the road would make him ceremoniously unclean, which would prevent him from doing his job in the temple, which would prevent him from providing for his family, which would mean that his wife and his kids would be plunged into poverty. So he was kind of stuck. 
and so too the Levite. He would have been in a similar sort of disposition because they were the tribe that was dedicated to serve the high priest in the temple. And so again, he would have had the same kind of religious obligation to keep himself pure so that he could go into the temple. Um, I have a really bad example that I've just, my like my filters tripped in my head. I'm not going to share it with you, but they just came. I was like, oh, yeah, that would be an interesting way of helping you understand it. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you about it at the barbecue, but not from the platform, uh, as some of you realize that it was probably important that that filter went off. The Samaritan. So who's the Samaritan? The Samaritans are the cousins of the Israelites. So a quick history um, on it. The Israelites were conquered by the Babylonians, and some of the people were left behind in the land while all of the, the, the able-bodied men and the rulers and the educated were taken into Babylon and then indoctrinated, and then they returned to the land. Well, those who stayed behind, they intermarried with those who were left, so the people around them, and they become the Samaritans. They are the distant cousins of the Jews. They also occupy the land while the Jews are in um, Babylon during the exile. So you can imagine um, we get exiled uh, by Canada, uh, probably the most unlikely country to do it. And uh, they take all the able-bodied men and the educated, and they leave some people behind. It's 30, 40 years. You come back. You want your house back. There's some people in your house. You're a bit frustrated. Maybe you don't like them. Maybe you hate them. Maybe you want to see them die. This would be the Samaritans for the Jews. Okay, great. So just to give you a little bit of background of who all of the characters are. Now, this is a powerful story because it does exactly what Jesus intends it to do. He wants to shift the understanding of how we define just who our neighbor is. After hearing this story, the expert is confronted with a new reality. This reality is maybe there is more expected of him than he had been doing. Maybe he's realizing that God is asking him to do more than just tick a box on a checklist. Maybe God is calling him to see not just those who are like him, but everyone as one of him. That there is no us versus them. That there's only us. Well, this is an expansion on what would have been a reasonable understanding from the expert's position. Maybe God is asking for more than he realized, and now he's confronted with that reality. And so after the telling of the story in verse, I think, 36, Jesus says, which of these three do you think became a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robber? And Jesus waits Because the passage just goes very quickly, right? It's just verse after verse after verse, and you think the dialogue is just happening so fast. It's not. Because he's about to commit, he's about to say something that is going to be profound, not only in his understanding, but shifts in understanding of how we see the hated other. There is this cognitive dissonance that he's experiencing now. Because Jesus doesn't tell him what kind of person it was who fell in the hands of the robbers. The person who fell into the hand of the robbers could have been a fellow Jew. So he would have had an obligation, based on his own reading of Leviticus 19, to help this person. But he sees these two Jewish people who turn away because they have other obligations, which are reasonable, which totally makes sense. There'd be no reasonable expectation for a priest to make himself ceremoniously unclean and to bankrupt his entire family to prevent himself from being able to atone in the temple just to help this vagabond that he sees on the side of the road this guy who's fallen in the hands of robbers i'm sorry for your luck maybe god will have mercy on you i'll see you in the new kingdom right 
But here the expert is confronted with this reality, and he has to give an answer because he wanted, remember, to test Jesus. That was the beginning of the passage. And so you could just imagine him just sort of, I do, I imagine him just sitting there <laughs> hoping Jesus would get bored and move on, <laughs> hoping something would happen miraculously, the earth opens up, maybe, you know, like he gets mute or something. Come on. Now he has to say the words, and once he says the words, he knows it's going to have a real demonstrative impact on his life. Verse 37. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. He can't even say the Samaritan. Listen, friends, he can't even name the person because to do so is to say that the enemy was the sort of the better one in the situation. Well, the one who had mercy. Oh, (laughs) okay. Jesus continues, then go and do likewise. Now, the original question remains unanswered by Jesus. Maybe it's because the question implies selectivity about who should be loved and who should be shown mercy. Instead, Jesus reflects on the larger question, maybe the one that the expert should have asked, which is, to whom must I become a neighbor? Just a little shift. It's it's almost an imperceptible shift. One of my sermon readers said, it's so imperceptible, I don't notice it. But I see it here because the the first question is, who's my neighbor versus how do I orient myself towards someone else? Who do I become a neighbor to? And the problem here is that we can't just answer this question with a list or a definition of neighbor. We can only answer this question having caught God's heart, having experienced See, Jesus doesn't answer because he wants us and the expert in the law to have two things that are necessary for us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Flexibility and compassion. Flexibility and compassion. And as we come to understand God's mercy and compassion towards us, despite the fact that we don't deserve God's compassion and mercy, That's what it's able to do in us. Well, we're able to have mercy and compassion towards others. I know, I know. We want our enemies punished and ourselves rewarded, right? When we get caught in sin, we want forgiveness. But when they get caught in sin, we want to give out tough love. You need to learn your lesson. You need to know that there are consequences, right? You want to practice this? Have kids. Kids are the fabulous way I have discovered. I mean, be a pastor of a church is another way, but (laughs) uh, I didn't want to shine the light on you too much. Have kids, right? I mean, they are just walking examples of like, I am going to bathe in mercy and compassion. And you have to like make it available to me all of the time. And you want to sit them down and say, do you understand the consequence of what you just did? Nope. I have no understanding of the consequence of what I did, right? Yesterday, my son, who I love, I love my son. He is so creative. He is so imaginative. He constantly wants to understand how things work. So we were in the guest room. You have those little Swiffer mops. And um, one of the, the, the window in the guest room was open and the screen was there. And he figured out if he puts the mop in a certain position, he can get the mop to stay upright, holding itself against the wall in the screen. And so he's delighted by what he's discovered. He runs out, he finds me, Dad, look at what I did. And I walk in, that screen cost $40. You already put a hole in it. Stop. And he looks, he's like, what is your problem? Like, look at what I did. I used my imagination. I held something up in the air by itself. I'm not touching it. That deserves praise. 
and all you have for me is derision. What is wrong with you? And so in that moment, I realized I'm looking at this the wrong way. And so I said, this is really great, Sebastian. I'm glad that you did this. Please don't do this again. Because <laughs> it's like, how do I explain to him $40? He has no concept of $40, right? Like, is that a lot of money? Uh, no, not really. I mean, for you it is, you know, it's this, it's that. And he's like, well, you can just get a new screen if it's broken. Of course I can. <laughs> now we laugh, right? Because we understand it. It's the child, sort of simple way of looking at how the world works. Well, it's us. I mean, we're not poking holes in screens. We're lying, we're stealing, we're cheating, we're being greedy, we're envious. We're taking what doesn't belong to us. And God is like, don't you see what this is doing to your life? And you're like, but look, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> and he's like, now you are. <laughs> but the consequences of these things will unfold. See, the moment at which we recognize that we are not deserving of mercy and compassion is the moment at which it unlocks us to offer it to others. Because we see ourselves reflected in the other who needs the mercy and compassion that we take for granted. If we lack flexibility and compassion, it doesn't matter who we define as neighbor because we will always experience the call to obey the greatest commandment as a metaphor for how we should live, not how we live. And it's easy to check out of this passage, isn't it? Right? None of us are really being assailed uh, by our enemies on a daily basis. Some of us, but not all of us, right? I mean, we're not just walking around having to, you know, protect ourselves all of the time. Oh, is there an enemy? Is there, an, you know, right? Like if I have an obnoxious coworker that steals our lunch, you know, we may have someone who says nasty things about you on the Internet, like, over and over again. We might have a relative who doesn't understand boundaries. And so we want to spend less time with them, and they don't understand why. But we don't sort of sit with that as this sort of prima facie understanding of how we implement this scripture. So I want to offer us a way forward. What if, in addition to loving our enemies as ourselves, Jesus is inviting us to do something more basic, like getting to know and learning to love our literal, physical neighbor? Remember, the Samaritans were the literal neighbors of Israel. And more than literal neighbors, they were actually family. So, you know, if you're having a problem figuring out how to love a neighbor, just find a family member that you don't, you know, sort of care for and use them as an example of how to move forward in the scripture. I mean, I bet if I tossed a stick out, I'd hit one of you, and one of you'd have a story where you can tell me about a relative that you try to avoid at all costs. And because I know many of you, I could probably name them for you. <laughs> so clearly, we need God's help, loving our neighbors as ourselves. They may be next door, or they may be for some of us, they may have become an enemy. And at the same time, we need a way, I believe, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. See, trying to love everyone all at the same time, all in the same way, guess what? It won't work. It won't get us very far. So here's a way forward. Why don't we break it down into a smaller part? What if we cooperate, or what if our cooperation with the Holy Spirit's desire to renovate us and to transform our hearts starts with us learning to live next to and love our literal, physical neighbors. So here's what we're going to do over the next several weeks. We're going to engage this sermon series on the art of neighboring. And today what I want to invite you to do is to consider starting with your literal neighbors. So to bring this into reality, because I asked you all to get a sermon handout, and if you didn't get one, there might be others on the uh, sermon cart, I hope. On the back of the sermon sheet is this nine by nine grid. And so this is the practical tip. Just want to try a little real world exercise. 
have you fill out the grid? And it just starts really simply by filling out the, ne uh, the eight closest neighbors. Now, let me just note, not all of us live in perfect little cul-de-sacs with eight neighbors that are all around us. Some of us live in apartment buildings. Some of us are in homeless shelters. Some of us are in dorms. Some of us uh, would rather, well, I won't say that. Um, some of us, <laughs> I'm on fire today. Um, like literal fire, not, not Holy Ghost fire. Um, so many of us are in different kinds of households, okay? And so as we come to this, we need to just be flexible. And so the simple way that I designed it is just a grid, and I didn't actually do it. Someone else did it for me. And what I want you to do just in this space right now, um, as I welcome the band back, is to start to fill out the neighbor map. And you can do it together if you have a spouse or a partner or roommate or a friend or one of your literal neighbors with you, uh, next to you, where you can start to fill it out. The first step is simple, which is write down the first name of your eight closest neighbors. And you can just use the grid as a way to keep track of them. All right? Now, some of you may be like, wow, Donnell, this is like shaming tool number one, right? Because if I can't figure this out and my like seat mates are fill, filling it out. Now I'm shamed. This is not to shame you. It's just to, if now if the Holy Spirit is convicting you, which is different, and you're like, oh man, I, I need to know who my neighbors are, then go with the Spirit, all right? This is just to help us recognize that we have no hope of loving our enemies when we don't even know the names of our literal neighbors. And the way that I thought about this this week as I was preparing for this, I was like, you know, my biblical understanding of love of neighbor has far outseeded my practical application of this. So I sit with you. I may know my eight neighbors, but I really haven't done much with them. And so as we go through the sermon series over the next three-ish weeks uh, from this week, I'm going to give us, including myself, some practical ways that we can start to reach out. So let's take a moment and fill this out as the band makes their way. And then uh, we'll continue on with the celebration. And you're not turning in. It's just for you. And then next week, I'm going to have magnets for you that you can put on your refrigerator if you have a refrigerator that can be magnetized so that you can then put it there so that you know um, what it is and where we're going. So I'm just going to sit here and fill mine out while you fill yours out while the band comes back. Once you get the names, because if you have all eight of your names, awesome, you get a prize. Uh, God will give it to you. The next step is to note um, like one additional fact that you know about them, like they work for the city or um, they're retired school teachers, which helped me remember my other neighbors who are retired school teachers. They're caring for their grandkids. They just moved in. So then you can just fill that part in. And then the third step, in the event that you've gotten all eight of your neighbors, you have one fact about all eight of your neighbors, now you can add a bit of in-depth information about the folks, which might be like, what careers are they in? What motivates them in their lives? Um, where are they finding purpose? Because then that begins to reveal that you've got this for, sort of deep connecting relationship with it, your neighbors. And then we're going to come back to this over the next several weeks. So you'll want to like pay attention to who you put on the list. And whatever I ask you to do, you have a freedom not to do it because it's really between you and the spirit. All right. So Sean's going to continue now in our act of, nope, Ainsley's going to lead us in our giving, um, which is a continuation of our act of worship. And then after uh, she leads us through our giving, uh, I think Anna Hilliker is going to come and lead us in communion. And then uh, do uh, stay afterwards. We're doing a church barbecue in the backyard, hot dogs, chips, drinks, cookies, and there's a bounce house as well. So Ainsley.